Good morning, everyone. Vance and I hope you are all feeling well. We are really enjoying the online services, but are both praying for the day when we can all be together, worshipping in God's house. service of morning prayer. This morning we're definitely starting with the penitential rite and when you get to the gospel as we kneel into it you'll know why that is and when we get to the collect you'll see that it is only through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with us and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever that we have hope and that we have peace. May this be a blessing to you, and may you grow this week in your faith and in your love of God. Amen. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. And let them return to the Lord, and he will have compassion. And to our God, for he will richly pardon. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we, we confess that, that we, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord is our refuge and our strength, O oh, come, let us worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God. And a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the caverns of the earth. And the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to hear his voice. The Lord is our refuge and our strength. Oh, come, let us worship. Let us hear God's holy word proclaimed. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared at in amazement through the bush, though the bush was engulfed in flames. It didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. 
When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look on God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly heard the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard the cries of distress because of their harsh treatment. Yes, I am aware of the suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hittites, and Jebredites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly they uh, treat the Egyptians, abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. The word of the Lord. The Lord has always been mindful of his covenant. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. The Lord has always been mindful of his covenant. Search for the Lord in his strength. Continually seek his face. The Lord has always been mindful of his covenant. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen. The Lord has always.
always been mindful of his covenant. Israel came into Egypt, and Jacob became a sojourner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people exceedingly fruitful. He made them stronger than their enemies, whose hearts he turned so that they hated his people and dealt unjustly with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. Hallelujah. The Lord has always been mindful of his covenant. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not, over, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's worship our Lord together. This is amazing grace. Thank you. 
Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So here we are. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, we like Peter. Peter was almost walking on water. Peter's rugged, he's handsome, he's a leader among men. He calls Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. He gets so much right. We're on Pete's side. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And it seems extremely harsh to us. I brought a prop. Let's pretend for a second that this is pure water. Perfect water. But the glass I found in the kitchen sink. I'm not sure it was washed. Are you still going to call this water pure. Questionable. I don't think you would. How about I tell you that I took some of our hand sanitizer, you know, the stuff you're not supposed to eat, and I wiped out that glass inside and out before I added the pure water. I mean, sanitizer is pretty darn clean, right? But would you call it pure water? And I, I don't think you would. Now, what about you've got a bit of spit in your mouth, you know, you can swallow that. But what if you pretend to spit into this pure water? Everything else is good. Glass is good. Water is good. You've spit in the glass. Can you drink this water now that you've spit in it? Gross, huh? When something is pure, it is utterly pure. And what Jesus is expressing here is the purity of God 
and the purity of his vision. What Peter has said, you know, you can't go to Jerusalem, you can't be killed, that is actually an affront to God's vision for us. And so when Jesus says, get me behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block. You are focused on the things of this world. You are not focused on divine things. He's calling out in Peter the absence of purity. The, the absence of purity makes the two incompatible, unreconcilable. There is nothing that you can put in the water and then pretend that it's still pure. You've added something. And in this situation, the human has taken the wrong stance. And Jesus calls it what it is. He is unerringly honest. He says, you are trying to distract me from what I need to do. The interesting thing, the interesting thing is that Jesus also says, um, right after this, he says, you must take up your cross. And that's so interesting because as of yet, we don't know in the story that Jesus will die on the cross. We're so familiar with that idiom and with that imagery that it almost sneaks past us that this is anachronistic. Um, he has not yet died. And yet he's using this language and when I look at it, I think, well, what would that have meant to those people at that time? And the only thing that I can imagine is when Jesus says, take up your cross, in that moment, at that time, it's actually meaning you are guilty. You are worthy of crucifixion. You know it. You have got a guilty conscience, and it doesn't matter what you do, you cannot get rid of it, and it's haunting you. You can't wash it from your hands, you can't forget it, because sin actually changes you, and you are incompatible with God. And he says, carry that cross. So when people were being crucified, they would literally have to carry the cross to the place of their crucifixion. That was very common. And so when Jesus says, take up your cross, I wonder, I wonder what kind of painful image that caused in them. And when we look at that expression, take up your cross, we kind of get lost in our modern usage. Modern usage is a little bit resentful um, you see somebody really suffering in a marriage or whatnot, and they say, well, it's just my cross to bear, you know, as though this piece of suffering, this external piece of suffering has been hoisted upon them by God. So they say, suffer it, deal with it, work on it, live with it. And that is not actually what's being said here. The whole point of carrying your cross is to carry the cross knowing that you are indeed guilty. And you are, if, if nothing else, you are not what you ought to be. And so how can we do it? What choice do we make? Do we carry it? Or do we, in our recognition of God, do we lend that weight to Jesus? And do we allow him to take that for us? When Jesus says, take up your cross, he's really saying, do this with me. My kingdom is otherwise. But when you recognize that the sacrifices you're making by 
you know, just letting your life unravel. You're not going anywhere. You must accept his sacrifice. There's a reason why Jesus desperately wanted to make it to Jerusalem and accomplish what he was accomplishing. And that's because in that movement, when he takes that cup, that tainted cup, and he bears our sins, and he drinks deep. He is accomplishing what we cannot accomplish. He's making the unpure pure. And what we must take up is his offer to accept him as Lord and Savior and to function in his realm. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to just light a candle. Candles are, <clears throat> excuse me, very helpful when we pray because they help us to center ourselves. Uh, they're not magic or anything, but they help us stay focused and to rest in God's presence. We've been reflecting the last few weeks on God's identity and our identity. And particularly today, the reflection is on our absolute need to be back in God's good grace and Jesus's function in order to accomplish that. When we pray, the first thing that we need to know is to whom we are praying. And as I pause, you must name him if you wish to pray. To whom is it that you pray? It might be to our Father in heaven our Lord Jesus Christ, they are one and the same, might be to the Holy Spirit. You know how you need to address God, and that's where we begin. And we kneel in because it is our identity as creatures within creation to require his good grace. In order to be at peace, and in order to find and hear his voice. I'm going to try to lead just a short section of prayer and I will leave spaces, spaces in which you are welcome to either aloud or in silence add your petition. We're going to begin, merciful and ever living God, we are going to begin by offering you all thanks for the mercies around us, for the abundance around us. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful nation of Canada, for its discipline and concern for its people. And we thank you for all those people that are helping to lessen the suffering in this world at this time. We thank you for creation. 
the wonder that you've given us. And we thank you for the challenge of stewardship that you leave with us. Merciful Lord, we raise up to you all those concerns that are in the world, the ones that we watch on television, the ones that seem to overwhelm us. We ask your good providence as humanity battles COVID. We ask your good providence as humanity struggles with democracy. And we ask your providence as we learn to deal with one another equitably so that all peoples might have the same advantages and the same status. We ask, Lord, that in their hearts they might always be aware that they are fully and completely your children. We pray, merciful Lord, for all of our local heartache. And I ask you to raise before God all of your local concerns Here in our community, we, we raise up to you, Reverend Larry and his family as they grieve. We raise up to you all those that we know are in nursing homes. And we raise up to you our families, who is not from a troubled family. We ask that you pour out your balm upon them and that we are a part of what you do in their lives that we might serve you by being a good part of that merciful and ever-living god we're kneeling in help us to take up our cross Help us to know that only you can bear it. Help us to know that the wonder and excitement of life around us is all from you. And that you are our joy and our light and our salvation. Jesus Christ, I ask it in your own name. Amen. Let us pray the Collect for this morning. Author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion, nourish us in all goodness, and of your great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Lord Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. Amen.
Bravo.